the first thing I noticed was the uniform. I'd seen an army uniform before, but usually on paler skin or partially constructed. An army shirt with blue jeans or army trousers with a white t-shirt. I see the wearer holding a bottle of Coca-Cola or a glass of iced tea on a late summer afternoon, surrounded by family members celebrating his return. Carvel, however, wore his full dress uniform, hat, tie, and all, which made the other passengers pause a moment and take notice. In turn, Carvel seemed uncomfortable with the attention, which might have been why he chose to sit down right next to me instead of taking advantage of the empty bench that faced us. He slid his duffel bag beneath the seat, then removed his hat and placed it on his lap. Davinian and Lana were the last two people to settle their things, although I seen them enter the train long before I did. They switched mul seats multiple times before selecting the last two in the coach, the ones across from Carvel and me. Like many of the passengers, they were dressed in their first Sunday best, but their first Sunday best apparel was of higher quality than many of us were fortunate enough to own. The Vinian wore a tie that seemed to change in hue and pattern as you watched it, and Lana flaunted, flaunted strand after strand of white pearls. Each shimmered a watery blue under the bright glint of the sun, resplendent. She was stunning in a beige dress with cream lace and accents. Lana was lighter skinned, the Vinian darker. The two complemented each other. Davinian removed his fedora and wiped his handkerchief across his brow while Lana waited some time to take off a wide-brimmed hat. When she did, I noticed that she had a mesmerizing eyes whose liquid hazelnut brilliance exuded clarity of soul. Once they were settled, Davinian by the window, Lana on the aisle with a small valise on her lap, Carvel introduced himself and stretched his hand out to Davinian, who shook it with the same warmth that was offered before introducing himself and his wife. Where did you serve, Divinian asked. Before Carvel had a chance to answer, Lana asked me, do you know how long this trip is gonna take? They say about a day, I answered. About a day, she repeated to Divinian. It'll be over sooner than you think, Divinian replied. Lana then reached a the glove hand into her purse, pulled out two wrapped pieces of hard candy, gave one to Divinian, and opened the other for herself. She placed the candy on her tongue, looked away from all of us through the window across the aisle, and waited until the train pulled away from the station, into the expanding sunlight, away from the station's shadow and gravity, to swallow. I looked out the same window, towards the shrinking platform, curious as to what interested her so much, because all I saw was a chaos of insects and ash and tin cans filled with tobacco spittle ru rusting in the sun. I saw a woman standing at the station platform trying to purchase a ticket. An old man sat on a bench near the platform, staring intently in the direction the trains had traveled from, as if he were waiting for something else, something better, to follow. The train rattled, metal, metal jolt, jolting metal, as cinders and traces of coal streaked the windows, each flaked the color of pepper, carrying its sharp scent throughout the coach. You had to blink through the fog of heat, noise, sweat, and conversation to maintain your bearings. Unlike Davinian, I wiped my brow with the back of my hand for fear that my handkerchief would never dry. We were moving. But on that platform, that old man's gaze didn't change. We were the only daily train. No others would follow. What was he waiting for? My father, my uncle, a slave ship, a tall ship, something ancient to return, but there was only smoke.